Well, good everybody, Sam Marwood here from Cultivate Farms. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently today. We're doing an audio rather than video. Uh, I thought you'd had enough of looking at my, my mug all the time. So what the point of this audio uh, update is around understanding the agriculture markets. Uh, we want to make sure you guys are, are literate in all things um, farming, uh, marketing, uh, and the agricultural market. So that's why we've got the experts who are big supporters of ours. Um, if you sign up to be a Cultivate Farms member, you also get a free, free subscription to their market analysis information. that comes out daily is Mercado. We've got Robert Herman on the line. Robert, how are you going? Oh, good, Sam. Great to hear from you again. Now, is it raining where you are in Ballarat? Uh, it was, but then it got too cold and it stopped. <laughs> Turned to sleet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And actually, look, it's not bad. I mean, people who live in Ballarat always get ribbed for it being cold, but we know there are colder places in Australia, just that they don't feature on any known maps, I don't think. <laughs> so, Robert, thanks for your time. So, the point of this, and we're going to do a number of these uh, over time, is to give a bit of a snapshot of where the market is at the moment, and we'll put a call out to aspiring farmers around what they're interested in. And a lot of the discussion has been around the lack of rainfall over the last month uh, or even more, even this first half of 2017. Uh, so we thought it'd be great to unpack uh, your knowledge around how that's impacting uh, grain prices, even uh, cattle prices. Um, and also we had a quick chat just then around um, beef and, and the problems in India and Brazil and how that uh, impacts on the Australian market as well. So Robert, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Um, what is the rain doing? Uh, for our grain prices and uh, and also the effect it has on international prices. Look, it's a good it's a good point to raise because as farmers we all worry about the rain, mm. um, and we generally worry about it in terms of our own specific location. So, what effect is it having on our crops? Where, when it comes to pricing and markets, it's actually a much bigger issue than that. So, what we've seen in the last um, four years, I suppose, in grain markets is that we've had really very, very good production, and, and by that I mean very good rain, all around the world. So stocks have grown, and as stocks grow and, and production is pretty well assured, then prices fall. That's what we've seen happening. Now, in the last couple of months, though, we've seen um, in, in the US in, in particular that it's got a little bit drier, and, uh, and the effect of that is that that people who are going to buy grain in the future, they get a bit nervous about that dry because it means stocks, you know, the harvest is going to be a bit lower, therefore stocks might fall and it might be a little bit more difficult to procure grain. So the effect of that is, and, and people would see that uh, a lot of times the world wheat price is quoted in cents per bushel. Uh, well, the market's gone up in, since June, since, since the beginning of June, by 100 cents a bushel. And that's almost a 20% rise, Sam. Yeah. You were going to ask me what does that mean in Australian dollars a tonne? Well, I was trying to get my head around it all and going, okay, so what's the current price? What is that? Uh, what's that in terms so, of percentage? So what that means is that uh, the price, as a result of, um, you know, northern hemisphere tightness or dryness in the, in the season, uh, it's pushed up Australian prices about $50 a tonne. So uh, the farmers here that are growing crops, it's up about $50 a tonne. We've also got probably a few more concerns about our season now. And I noticed the Bureau of Meteorology has reported that, you know, there's a reasonable expectation that the spring is going to be a bit drier than average. They're not talking disaster yet, but just a little bit drier. And so they're the things that really drive grain prices. So so how are you keeping your finger on top of all of this, Robert? So you're, you're, you're trained yourself to keep on top of the weather patterns across the world. Um, or you're unpacking, you're looking at trends from previous uh, previous uh, dry spells um, to be able to watch all this. What's the uh, what are those little tips? Yeah, look, we the only reason we keep an eye on the weather or the weather forecasts and the weather reports is because of the effect on markets. Mm. Um, so we don't really try and predict the weather, but we do keep an eye on it. And and one of the things you know is what's happened. To date, we know how much rain has been had. We know what would be ideal. So, for instance, in Australia, we know that there's a lot of country uh, that's had wheat planted that really is looking for more rain. We know there's some areas, especially in southern Victoria, that are very good. But 
it's the overall picture which tells us what the, is going to be the likely effect on price. So we watch that closely. In terms of the forecasts, I mean, they are just that, they're forecasts, but they do give us some idea about the risk that's ahead and, and we factor that in. So there'd be farmers right now mm. sitting on a, a stack of grain that they haven't sold yet? They're, or is this also for people who are looking to sell uh, for the coming season? Uh, how, how are people uh, navigating um, the, the current prices? How do you use this to yeah, so, uh, get your income now or to uh, bolster your income in the future? What's the, what's the normal process of there, Robert? Yeah, well, look, it's a, it's a good question. You've hit the nail on the head there, Sam. It's about two parts to it. One is that if you've got grain and you're still holding it, then right now the the prospects are that the price is going to improve. So you could take a selling strategy that uh, has a bit more optimism in it. So you might be thinking, well, if I've held the grain to this point, um, it probably wasn't the smartest thing to do after harvest because grain didn't go up for a long time, but it has started to rally now. Uh, then you might say, well, I'll hold it a bit longer or, um, or I can certainly sell it at a higher price than what I could have sold it. A month or two ago. Yeah. If you're talking about the next year's crop, though, that becomes a little bit more complex because we've got it. We can forward sell, and there's always a price for grain out there, which is a really good thing for the grain market. But you don't want to be forward selling something you're not going to produce. So managing managing the risk of having a poor crop, or even in some cases no crop, versus being able to sell for a high price or a set or an attractive price is a real balancing act, and that's where you've just got to be careful. Um, so the worst case would be that if you sold grain forward and then the season failed or you couldn't deliver it, you didn't have the quality you sold or whatever, um, that needs to be managed in a forward sale. Like compared to last year where you could pretty confidently forward sell anything because, you know, production was pretty well assured. We had a really great season coming up. Mm. This year it's a little bit more tricky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not from the, the grains background, so it's always um, been a bit of an unknown world, this whole grain and forecasting and holding on and when do you sell, when do you wait, that sort of stuff. It um, sounds pretty complex to me. Yeah, it it is and it isn't. I mean, it's like anything, Sam, you know, it's complex until you actually take a little bit of time to figure it out. And then if I can, the, the one bit of advice I would give is that you figure out something and you then put in place an action plan that you feel comfortable with. So to feel comfortable with something, you know, it's got to make sense, mm. uh, you've got to understand it, and you've got to be comfortable that it fits with your um, program. Yeah, I like that. That's good. And having the nerve to stick to the plan. Uh, not only the nerve, but the um, resolve to do it. You know, yeah. that's part of the problem. You know, you've just got to – if you put these plans in place, um, it's a bit silly if you then don't stick to them. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, what about uh, the area? I know a little bit more around livestock. Uh, what's the yeah. lack of rain having in there, Robert? Well, look. What, at the moment, it's not having much impact at all, but it can have a big impact. And people will remember back, you know, in um, like a couple of years ago, where we had a really dry period, and it, it, it affects the markets. But it affects the markets because there's so many stock coming on at once. So. My advice would be that when you're going into a dry period, if, if that's going to affect your property, then start to make sales very early, you know, even to the point of being a little bit safer than you should be. So if you, if you think you're going to sell off, uh, you know, half your cattle in the next three months, perhaps make your sales in the first month rather than in three months' time because by then everybody's trying to sell. The other thing to keep an eye on is because – Cattle can be moved anywhere in the country. So if if Queensland's having a dry period, what you'll find is that they'll be selling a lot of cattle, and those cattle will push down those sales will push down into New South Wales, and and the meatworks and the processors that are buying down there, and it'll impact on our market. So we've got a national um, market influence when it's dry in some areas. Um, make sure that you're having a look at other areas and not just your own in terms of what the season is doing. Yeah, and then it's all again also tied in with uh, if you haven't got the feed, um, you've got to uh, move move stock on as well. It's a tricky balance, isn't it? But then again, that's that planning ahead, thinking about what's what's 
what's it looking like if it doesn't rain, uh, even though it is raining now That's in right. um, Again, just having that plan of uh, what you can what you can hold, uh, what the price is looking like, um, and, and planning forward. I think also, Sam, um, it's it's a lot easier right now because we are seeing very very good prices for livestock. Yeah. So there's not much argument to say. Uh, I should be hanging on to them and, and hope that the season's going to come good. If your season isn't good now, then quickly get rid of your stock um, because the risk is that as the season gets worse, more and more stock will come onto the market and that will push the price down. Mm, that's a good point. Very good point. Well, what about uh, livestock and speci specifically beef? Um, uh, outlining India and, and Brazil are having some problems Robert, what are, what are those problems, and what's the uh, yeah? Well, impact? well, Brazil's got um, got a number of issues, but one of the most serious ones is the president has just been charged with corruption, and it's okay. particularly related to the beef industry. Um, and so, if people would know that in Australia, the biggest beef processor is JBS, and they're a, um, a company that's, that began in Brazil and it's now worldwide. But um, it's not saying that it will affect their Australian operations, but what it's doing for um, Brazilian beef is that its reputation is being tarnished. So part of the corruption and part of the problem is that there was beef that was exported that was just um, rotten beef. It was bad beef. And um, and now we've seen that um, uh, China has said, you know, they don't think beef from Brazil is up to standard, so so they're not going to take it. Now what And, and what that means is that Australian beef, which is highly regarded, um, has one less competitor in those markets, so so that's good for us. Yeah. Um, the point I'd also make, Sam, is though that it just tells you how important your reputation is. So Australia's got this great opportunity to keep disease out and, and to have a high standard of beef exports. It's something we've got to really continue to work on. Um, so the quarantine situations have to be maintained at a really high standard. And we have to keep measuring our beef to make sure that people get what they expect they're going to get, and um, and that's where the quality issue comes in. I think you're spot on, and uh, um, this is one thing we've been harping on as well around the, the power of social media uh, to tell a story of what we're doing as farmers and as even aspiring farmers telling their story to gain that trust, even in a, a local area. But um, social media can reach across the world um, to help generate, you know, that better story of what we're doing here. Um, which is that higher standard, um, and uh, as anything in life, uh, if you're doing things well, it's going to work out for the better in the long run, isn't it? And it sounds like that's what's happening here with with our quality over um, maybe less appropriate practices elsewhere. That's right. I mean, another one that came to light in the last couple of weeks was that India banned the export of all beef and buffalo. Now, um, there's a bit of smoke and mirrors around it and, and no one's sure about how it's going to play out. But um, in India, um, the predominant religion is Hindu. And, of course, um, cows are sacred to Hindus, so they don't want to kill them. They've also banned buffalo because one of the things that was happening was that people were saying, oh, we're not killing cows, we're just killing buffaloes. And they said, okay, we'll fix that. There's no buffaloes being killed either. And, uh, and they threw camels in for good measure, Sam. They said, you're not allowed to kill and export camels anymore either. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you wanted to be a um, you know, part of the, uh, the herd, the best place to be at the moment would be in India. You're pretty safe. But what, what that means for us is not that we're exporting similar type beef as buffalo or, or camels or anything like that. It just means that into Asia where a lot of that beef was and buffalo was being exported, um, they won't get it now, and that just means that they're going to, have to go somewhere else, which is another market for Australia. Yeah, brilliant. So, how long would that take to trickle in to see the effects? It, it'll, it'll be. You're trickling in is the right word, Sam. It won't be a. You know, you won't suddenly see in our sale yards here people bidding up. You know, a couple of dollars a kilogram extra because they can't get buffalo in uh, in Singapore or something, mm -hmm. or Vietnam. But um, it, it'll be a trickle effect, and it, but it'll be a positive trickle effect. You know, a lot of times markets are impacted by trickle effects. Sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're positive. In this case, it'll be a positive. And it's a bit like this other stuff we hear about. We hear a lot about trade, you know, trade agreements and trade negotiations, trying to take down barriers. Once again, they are trickle effects, but they're things that are trying to make our beef more competitive 
or able to compete better in uh, the markets that we're aiming for. Robert, this has been great. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. So I think um, we have had plenty there for people to digest. I hope everybody appreciates uh, what uh, we're doing here because we're giving you access to very clever people such as Robert Herman uh, to unpack uh, the, the ag market. And, uh, and even if you aren't a farmer, you're an aspiring farmer, uh, some of these things might not be uh, relevant to you today, but uh, just to know that these are the things you need to be thinking about when you eventually go on your farm, I think is a really powerful thing. Um, so Robert, thank you very much uh, again for your time. Um, everyone out there, please send in your questions. We'll do this maybe in a couple of months' time, Robert, um, and unpack uh, where the market is then. Look forward to it, Sam. Thank you. Speak soon. Cheers, mate.